Welcome to View from the Top at Cyboss. I am Mayur Shetty, Banking Editor at the Times of India. Our guest today is Mr. Raj Kiran Rai, MD and CEO of Union Bank of India. He is also the Chairman of the Indian Banks Association. Mr. Rai, thank you for being here. Let me start by asking you a few questions. Uh, Mr. Rai, you are a veteran of Indian banking. You have seen banks from the time of uh, branch banking in the 90s and then evolved to core banking and now the digital challenge. The prior banks had an advantage of core banking when they started out. Do you think uh, the public sector banks have lost out now because they have not moved into digital as fast? Yeah, uh, the movement was pretty fast from core banking to digital. So from manual to core banking, it took some time and at that time also it made a difference. But then that time private banks were not that aggressive actually. So uh, the market share was lost much after that. So that was the thing. But then uh, now when we look at digital banking, this is happening pretty fast. The changes are pretty quick. So I think uh, public sector banks are uh, taking longer time uh, shifting to digital technologies compared to the private sector counterparts. So this will be a game changer, so we need to be uh, pretty fast in our uh, digitization, uh, otherwise we may lose market share, uh, now we have lost market share in more, many retail, many of the retail products and all that, so we need to catch up quickly. But the advantage of public sector bank is the kind of customer base they have, the kind of spread they have, and uh, the areas where public sector banks are operating for private sector are yet to reach out. So there are still some advantages with the public sector banks, but maybe we have one or two years to catch up on digitization. So co-banking is now almost two decades old. Now with the onset of digital banking, consultants are talking about a complete revamp of co-banking and uh, hauling out the core and moving to a cloud architecture. What are your thoughts on uh, Yes, actually the core banking is having too much of load. Actually with the uh, entry of so many digital products, ultimately even if there is a balance inquiry, it has to hit uh, my core banking system. Uh, we have seen with the kind of UPI transactions, uh, uh, like uh, how much load which uh, like uh, is on core banking despite our planning for higher volumes but there is a pressure on uh, core banking so there are thoughts actually like whether uh, we need to have two systems operating and uh, like uh, whether the core banking is adequate to take that extra load and all that so these are under discussion now so i think uh, we need to evolve because even the technology companies which are providing this core banking uh, they also have to innovate a lot because uh, this is like a, a very good product for them. Banks have a compulsion once we have implemented a particular product, we can't move anywhere. So mm -hmm. they need to upgrade quickly and uh, like uh, make it compatible with the digitization. So mm -hmm. that is important and plus the load on core banking system should come down because the volumes are too heavy now. So uh, I think uh, it has to move forward. Uh, I, I am not able to say what, what will be the shape. Uh, mm. But then something will definitely emerge. We may have to have uh, different systems handling different kind of uh, customer uh, transactions. What about financing cross-border trade? How is bank banking changing over there? The, here also the technology is going to uh, play a big role. Uh, there are trade finance modules coming up. Actually, we are also implementing one of them. Mm -hmm. I, uh, like, uh, you know, in trade finance, uh, particularly international trade, if we have letter of credits, bills moving across and all that. Here there is a lot of work going on uh, blockchain technology also. So uh, there is a lot of data available but then the, the technology has not played a big role here as of now because uh, the banks are controlling the major portion of this uh, international trade but not much of digitization has happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, SWIFT is also a partner here, uh, particularly enabling this. And there is a lot of work happening there also on the trade finance side. This also will uh, move. Actually, in the initial phase, before we get into the new product development, which will happen on the retail MSME mm -hmm. space, I think uh, enabling the customer to use technology will happen first. Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, he can open a letter of credit sitting at his office or his home, pr pushing the data. Like you know, today if you want a personal loan, how you push the data and then you can get an online sanction. So similarly, it is going to happen for this also, where the letter of credit, even your bill discounting and all that is going to happen online. And already there is technology and uh, I am quite happy to share Union Bank is also implementing one of these technologies. Now we are quite ahead uh, developing this technology. So this is the changes which are going to happen. 
and then uh, actually on the trade finance side again uh, there will be a lot of product developments happening. So, now we have a very very traditional way of funding basically like giving them packing credit, the post shipment credits, then uh, build discounting against LCs and all that. But then uh, what shape it will take I, I, I do not know, but then my initial interactions with people indicates when the technology is in place, when the, when the processes are like uh, uh, digitized, the product development in this space also will happen. We need to wait for uh, people to come in and uh, innovate here, but then there is excellent mm -hmm. opportunity. India developing as an export hub now, you are seeing the exports increasing uh, exponentially now. Mm -hmm. So, I think we need to be quick in providing this comfort to the customer, arranging for funds, discounting their bills pretty quickly and the technology is going to help in a big way. Public sector banks have been at the forefront of financial inclusion and a uh, few years back they started the Jandan program and uh, opened uh, universal bank accounts for almost every Indian in the country. Uh, at that time, it was seen as a kind of a burden because these accounts were low balances. Is technology now making it uh, more feasible to provide such services? But for technology, you would not have done it actually. See, today when we talk of PMJDY, uh, it was a one of the biggest changes uh, in the financial innovations and changes uh, which helped the digitization and the data creation in the system. As we talk, we have 43 crore PMJDY account in the system today. And initially it was thought uh, that uh, they may be a burden on the banks, but it is not. Actually today this 43 crore account, the balance is 1.45 lakh crores and the average balance is upwards of 3000 rupees. It is normal uh, savings account for us now. So, it, uh, it helped to mobilize a lot of uh, resources, low cost resources for the banks. It is no more a burden. And out of this 43 crore uh, PMJD account, nearly 32 crores rupee debit cards are also issued. So, actually all this is helping the digital uh, penetration uh, to the rural interlands. So, mm -hmm. it has really helped, it is no more a burden. And I will add one more thing, the Jam Trinity what we created, the uh, Jandan accounts, uh, Aadhaar and uh, then the mobile, it helped actually, uh, you know, uh, when the COVID hit, actually internationally we had one of the best systems. Within few hours, the money transfer took place to the credit of their accounts. When there was a decision by the government that we will give credit to uh, the poor people, actually it happened in minutes actually because we had already built the system. So, but for this, this would not have been possible and if you remember uh, transferring money to the ultimate beneficiary was a big, big issue earlier because there are a lot of uh, losses in between. Now it is a press of a button. So, we can reach out to the last person in a village within few minutes. So, this has uh, really helped us and uh, uh, mm -hmm. even the help the country to cope up with the COVID uh, much better. On the, on the credit side, uh, one of the focus area of the government is improving the ease of doing business. Uh, how are banks helping uh, their corporate borrowers to do business more easily through digital banking? I will put it this way, actually to lend more easily, we need to have more data points and the data points should be authentic. Mm -hmm. There should not be any manipulation in the data given into the banks actually. That is very, very important. I think the corporate governance has evolved in the last few years very well. Mm -hmm. Today, when I look at a corporate, whether it is GST returns or the balance sheet being submitted to MCA, everything is verifiable online. Mm -hmm. So, I am much more confident in taking a decision. So, that is why today there is a good differentiation between good corporates and uh, not so good corporates and they are able to uh, like we are able to price it right also. Mm -hmm. So, this uh, in a way when we started with the digitization, mm -hmm. digitization has multiple uh, ways of uh, helping banks. So, this is actually really helping particularly the GST mm -hmm. returns which are filed online and since we have a process of verifying this online now. So, it mm -hmm. is really helping us to take decisions. So, ease of uh, assessing the credit requirement of the corporate has much become much easier today. And uh, I am very sure as we go forward, uh, like uh, the manual uh, interventions will become less and less. It will be more rule based because mm -hmm. data are more reliable. Some of the collaborations by banks has led to a lot of innovations, the national financial switch which ultimately led to uh, developments like uh, the UPI, this was all an outcome of collaboration. So, how is collaboration among banks helping right now? Uh, like, you know, when we started, initially it was said FinTech is going to compete with the banks. Mm -hmm. 
but actually it has become more of a symbiotic relationship now. Yeah. The fintechs are helping us actually, they are no more a competitor to us. Uh, because these players to compete with us, they also need to have funds to lend. So yeah. it is very difficult for them to raise the resources like we raise. So naturally it, is, it makes sense for them also to collaborate yeah. with the banks. So we are having a lot of collaboration. We have many products where fintechs are already working with us. Mm -hmm. So and it is going to take off in a big way. The digital lending space, it will be nothing but fintech tie-ups. With developments like this open credit enhancement network, which is going to automate the provision of credit, how do you see banking changing in future? We are already on the job uh, in getting into this uh, platform. Uh, it is called account aggregator uh, concept. Uh, to put it simply, uh, the account aggregator is a model. Reserve Bank has put a guideline few years back, but mm -hmm. then somehow it didn't take off to the extent it is required mm -hmm. because uh, the collaboration among all the players in the ecosystem should mm -hmm. uh, come through. Now there is a better realization of that. Mm -hmm. In the account aggregator, uh, the customer has the choice mm -hmm. because he has a lot of data that how much insurance policies he has, how much mutual fund investment he has, mm -hmm. how much savings money he has, and what are the other uh, asset products, assets he has, and what are the loans he has availed. All these data points are available. Now he will choose to share that data with anyone he of his liking. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is a one point verification. So this is, this is going to be a huge enabler actually, particularly mm -hmm. the open credit system because uh, with the advantage of uh, so much of data in the system, the decision making will be much faster. So uh, for my rule based engine lending basically, mm -hmm. the digital lending what we call, basically we need to get the data online and we should be able to verify the data online and the account aggregator is going to facilitate all that. The mm -hmm. customer will be the king, he will be the king and he will decide and choose where to share the data. So, you will mm -hmm. have complete control on his data and he will share with the person whom he wants to share. For a lender, it is going to be a game changer and we need to quickly get onboarded on that. And um, recently also there are a lot of discussion going on on account aggregator concepts. I am again like, uh, you know, it can be UPI movement for a digital lending, like UPI for payment space and account mm -hmm. aggregator can be like a game changer for digital lending. Right, sir. The Reserve Bank of India has been quite uh, ahead of the curve in uh, innovation. It's been allowing uh, a lot of innovation in a controlled environment uh, through sandboxes and all. Uh, a lot of these innovations are from uh, fintech companies. Are banks innovating enough? Do you think that uh, they need to do more? Yes, actually, uh, I think maybe uh, the management bandwidth uh, in the mm -hmm. public sector space at least uh, on thinking about uh, innovations and uh, like uh, digitization mm -hmm. is quite less. Actually, uh, like uh, we have the traditional uh, people who, who are good in technology, they are good mm -hmm. in managing the core banking systems and handling technology, but then they are not uh, uh, in the space of innovating and uh, like developing new products and all that. They are only trying to catch up actually. So if somebody has developed a product, they will look at it and try to match. So the time has come where we need to be innovative. So we need to get the right talent in. That is very important for public sector space. The time has come mm -hmm. that we need to recruit and uh, uh, get the new talent from the system who are in this space. Because these are totally different areas. It is not in traditional banking. We need a totally different kind of thinking and a thought process uh, mm -hmm. for innovation. So which uh, we are also doing now. And then we need to invest on technology continuously and upgrade. See, now when you look at your mobile banking, when you look at your net banking, when you look at your lending autom automation, when you look at your trade finance modules, they are all quite outdated today. So we need to upgrade. There are a lot of technologies available. So banks have to invest and upgrade all these and uh, bring it to one stack actually because the customer interface should be one now. So that is very, very important. So you can't have four different apps for uh, four different products. Mm -hmm. We need to ha have one app where uh, in the back office you have to integrate, not at the customer space. So customer mm -hmm. interface should be one and it should be smooth enough. Ultimately, what is going to differentiate between different lenders is the customer experience. Mm -hmm. So who is going to give you a better customer experience is, is going to matter. Uh, the flip side of uh, digitization has been the growing number of uh, malware attacks and cyber attacks uh, that uh, India has seen and uh, there are reports that India is a hot spot for such attacks. So what, what kind of precautions uh, can banks take against risks like this? 
Actually, again, it is a, uh, we need to develop technology-based solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, we invest again on cyber security a big way. Mm -hmm. Actually, I am very proud that uh, IDRBT is another mm -hmm. institution of uh, RBI, which drives a lot of these technology innovations. So, they have ranked uh, Union Bank as number one on uh, cyber security related activities. Mm -hmm. So, we do a, uh, like a lot, we do a lot of work. See, it is not only cyber security where we continuously keep a watch on uh, probable attacks and all that. Then actually you need to monitor your transaction on a, a second to second basis, not even minute to minute. So like we have enterprise uh, fraud risk management systems. Mm -hmm. Like if you are using your credit card, these systems will track. Like mm -hmm. if you have a particular way of using your credit card and mm -hmm. suddenly we see a much different kind of transaction in your credit card. Mm -hmm. So this system will alert us. So it is just an example. So that kind of technologies are available. We have implemented most of them now. Mm -hmm. So that way uh, system level hacking has not happened in the last many years you would have seen. Mm -hmm. Most of these frauds are happening because the customer compromises somewhere. It has either happened through vendors who have slightly less uh, secure systems so th mm -hmm. through that some hacking happens like uh, sometimes the database of credit cards or something like it is get into the dark web mm -hmm. so uh, that data pilferage which happens or um, uh, through the customer actually most of the frauds what we read because the customer uh, shares the OTP or other details because they, they are fooled by someone Mm -hmm. uh, making them uh, like believe that somebody from the bank is calling. Mm -hmm. Maybe even th through this I will make an appeal to customers. Mm -hmm. Bank has all your data. We will never ask for those data. Like mm -hmm. if I am asking for your date of birth, actually then there is somebody else calling because I have it on my screen. If somebody calling, it will be on his screen. Mm -hmm. So actually people share the data still. So most mm -hmm. of the frauds which are happening is because customers share the data. So I think customer awareness is something which we have to continuously invest on and uh, this financial literacy of not sharing their passwords or OTPs mm -hmm. uh, is something which has to really get in. Then mm -hmm. only we can be feeling safe. Till then, mm -hmm. uh, these fraudsters will have uh, their uh, like field day mm -hmm. cheating people. Mm -hmm. Banks have moved almost entirely to digital. What is the need for paper in banking right now? Is there, do you think there are any legislative changes that are required now? I think we will move to paperless. Uh, how many years, uh, it, it can be two years, three years, five years, I don't know. Uh, we have started digital documentation for the loans now in a small way. And uh, I'm seeing that next one to two years, uh, most of the documentation on the loan side will happen digitally. So there will not be any physical paper because now uh, the stamp duty payment is enabled by, by most of the state government to pay online. So that was one of the biggest hurdle we had. And uh, there are, uh, like uh, digital documentation is happening for which standardization of document is a must across the banks like bank guarantees, LCs and lot of other uh, loan documents which is happening actually it is a work in progress now. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing lot of digital documentation happening. So that is one side. On the KYC side actually that is where we store lot of papers, the physical paper. Now that is also becoming digital. Now there is a concept called CKYC. Now we have so much data of customer and uh, one or the other player in the mm -hmm. system, either it is bank or insurance company, they are mm -hmm. having KYC data of a customer. Now the customer is given a CKYC number. Now once he has a CKYC, wherever he is going, if KYC is needed, he has to just share the CKYC number with them and he did not submit any papers. So with all this technology uh, in place, mm -hmm. I do not think there will be need of papers. So, uh, it depends on the speed with which it is getting implemented, but then we will see paperless uh, banking and no document, no paper in the bank, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like maybe within five years. And even uh, checks used to be one of the biggest, uh, like, uh, you know, the paper which we store, security, mm -hmm. uh, this thing. But with the UPI coming in, a lot of other digital payments, the volume in physical checks also coming down substantially. It will not go away, payment through checks are still there. But then it has reduced substantially. Once that goes away, I will tell you, the burden on the banks on storing of documents will also go down substantially. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a increased shift to digital, not only on the customer side, but also on the processes side. What are the changes that are here to stay? Uh, that's what I'm telling, the digital documentation and e-signing, yes. basically, where there is no wet signature needed. 
Actually, this is one of the biggest innovation during the COVID period because actually we launched some of the products where customer can sign digitally. So that is something. And the KYC, moving to CKYC, these are all the things in the making and but uh, COVID has helped uh, this to be fast forwarded actually. Like you know your UPA, the payment and all that. So I think we have seen almost 3.5 billion transaction in the last month. Mm -hmm. So it is really taking off and uh, uh, you know this year to stay. I think COVID because there was no physical interaction, you can't mm -hmm. go travel and all that and we were avoiding uh, all kind of uh, physical contact. So the digital payment space really picked up during this period. Mm -hmm. Now once a customer uh, becomes comfortable in a digital payment uh, and he sees that this is much easier. So mm -hmm. he will never go back to the earlier system. So mm -hmm. this is here to stay. I don't think uh, it will go away. But one thing that will uh, continue to be there is the customer visit to branches. Mm -hmm. Now during COVID time, there was less visit to branches. Now we are seeing customer coming back because at least 50% customers in the system, they are comfortable going to a branch, talking to a branch manager and doing physical transaction. Because this is a, uh, like, uh, you know, change uh, in the uh, way we do banking and it needs a change in the way, like, uh, look at things. Mm -hmm. So it will take some time. So physical banking is easier to stay because customers are happy visiting branches. Mm -hmm. So that has picked up. So this is reversed already. Mm -hmm. But all other things are irreversible and it is going to pick up. How is digital lending changing the banking landscape? It is changing in a big way uh, because of the mainly because of the data availability and so many ecosystem uh, partners coming in. So I feel that uh, at least 50 percent of the loans uh, under retail and MSME uh, will move to uh, digital lending platforms right from sourcing to documentation level. When I say it's a full straight through process, end to end, mm -hmm. in next two to three years. So we need to cope up with this speed. And if you don't have that product, which can give that uh, product to the customer, he applies online through net banking or mobile, and the documentation happens, uh, process happens, everything happens online, and his account gets credited or he gets paid for the vehicle he's buying, or the house he's buying, all those things. So we need to get this product and technology in next two to three years. I see that at least 50% moving into these platforms. So we are working towards that. We already have launched some products in this space. So we are experimenting and it's a good learning experience. So this is what I foresee. We will see a big uh, revolution in MSME lending. Uh, because right now the stress book in MSME is quite high and all that. People may be scared to lend to MSMEs. Because th there are two ways of lending to MSMEs. One is uh, through the GST invoices when they buy raw material. So funding that directly instead of giving them an open limit. The second is the receivable funding when they supply their good to someone who accepts that bill. So these are the two play, uh, like uh, parts where MSMEs need funding. Raw material buying and when they supply a good uh, till the money is received from the buyer. So these are the two legs where they need maximum working capital. And these two spaces, we will see revolutionary changes in technology and the funding will happen. Like TREDS is already there, which is nothing but a receivable financing. This will all evolve in the next uh, two, three years. And uh, working capital lending to MSME will move from open credit, like working capital, cash credits and all that, to very targeted lending, like very specific invoice discounting, uh, very specific supply bill discounting and that kind of thing. So these are the changes which will happen in the lending space. So banks have to plan and cope up with this uh, technology. They have to adapt very, very fast. Because when this change happens, customers will move to this platform pretty quickly. So you will lose market share if you don't have these products. So at least 50% of the customers who are very good in the system and uh, tech savvy, they will move to these systems pretty quickly. Finally, sir, you have this unique experience of amalgamating three large public sector banks in the middle of a lockdown and uh, subsequent restrictions during the pandemic. Would you like to share some of your learnings during this period? Like uh, this is a great experience actually. I don't think uh, there is any parallel to th this actually. Even in private sector amalgamations or mergers take a lot of time and uh, I see in majority of them failing also. So, but then in public sector space, uh, it's unimaginable that in a period of one year we could complete it despite COVID. The credit goes to our teams. Actually, once people realized 
that uh, the government is very firm on their decision it is inevitable all the resistance died down and uh, people started looking at a common entity because they knew that the future mm -hmm. is with the amalgamated entity everybody contributed so we followed very systematic processes Luckily for us, we had two experiences uh, mm -hmm. of State Bank of India amalgamation and Bank of Baroda amalgamation in front of us. And we had a detailed deliberation with the bo like both the uh, banks mm -hmm. and we learned uh, from them. So we could cut short on some of the time which uh, they uh, spent on certain things which we can shortcut. So that saved time. Actually, our technology integration happened within 10 months. The credit goes to our technology providers also mm -hmm. because of the experience what they had. They also expedited the process. So, and uh, customer experience has been very good. Actually, during amalgamation, many times customers face a lot of problems. So, we kept it to minimal. I, I can't say that it is almost problem, like it is almost problem free. Yes, there were some small issues, but we could fix most of them pretty fast. And within 10 months, the technology integration happened. And the biggest challenge in any amalgamation is human resources amalgamation. The technology, you know, at the back end, you sit and amalgamate. But then human resources is, you are playing with the emotions of people, like, you know, and the sentiment of the people. And they are in that organization for decades. Accepting a new reality, accepting a new culture and all that is not that easy. But then everybody coped up. And, uh, you know, today the way the banks are running as an amalgamated entity, it proves that uh, it has really worked and we are seeing a lot of synergy benefits. And uh, kind of investment needed in technology uh, is huge. Actually, for smaller banks, it may be a bit difficult to invest that kind of money in technology. For larger organization, it is much easier. Because the kind of operating profits we are generating, you are seeing that number, the kind of profitability we are having today, the power to deal with the issues is uh, much stronger now as an amalgamated entity. And we are in a much better position because we started with the technology investments, digitization and all that. Mm -hmm. As a large entity, we are quite ahead of the curve, investing in technology and taking this forward. So this has really worked in our favor, but the credit goes to our team. Because if you really get into the nitty gritties, there are so many things which are to be handled. Not only the human resources, products were different, processes were different, policies were different. Even though like it is all government in, of India owned public sector, mm -hmm. everybody had evolved in their own way. So now the teams, there were 31 teams of GMs who were working to rationalize all these products, processes, policies and ultimately none of us interfered, no MD or ED interfered mm -hmm. in the process. They evolved as a uh, amalgamated entity, this is what we want to have, this is the product we want to have, this is the policy we want to have and on the day one of amalgamation, 1st April uh, 2020, we had that. So the common product and all that and the technology integrated very well. Another advantage I had was uh, Union Bank was heavily into centralization much before amalgamation. We had created our uh, retail processing points, MSME processing points, mid-corporate branches across the country. Mm -hmm. So moving uh, extra as well Andhra Bank and Corporation Bank to those platforms were much easier for me because mm -hmm. the structure was already existing. So and But then we did it very democratically which regional office to close, which regional office to open and uh, all those things, you know, we did it very democratically. I sat in sat, uh, sat at Hyderabad, Andhra Bank headquarters, I sat at headquarters of uh, Corporation Bank at Mangalore, sat with the whole team, I interacted with every GM of those banks much before merger, took their views, took their opinion on where to have administrative offices, which offices to close. So it was a very democratic process. So everybody owned the process. The success because is because everybody owned the process. It was not driven by a one bank or one MD. It was driven by everyone. It came from the roots. So respect was given to every opinion. And that is the root, like I think maybe the mantra of our success. One aspect of international lending is uh, the benchmarks that you use. And now with the LIBOR on its way out, how are banks preparing for the change? I think Indian banks are well prepared. Uh, here the Indian Bank Association played a pivotal role along with the Reserve Bank of India. So we were working continuously on this and uh, we were doing a lot of seminars, talking to the banks and all that. All guidance are given. Now the alternate reference rates uh, 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 have evolved and uh, we are already seeing deals happening. So here there are two parts that the new deals happening at uh, new alternate reference rates which, is, which started happening now. 
and then the existing uh, advances uh, mm -hmm. where actually the LIBOR is a benchmark, we need to have adequate documentation to move them to the new reads. So banks have done that also. So the preparation levels are quite high and uh, I do not foresee any problem for the Indian banking space to uh, migrate to the new alternate rates whenever the LIBOR uh, they stop uh, giving the LIBOR rates. So we are quite prepared. Thank you very much Mr. Roy. Thank you. Thank you so much.